Have you ever tried to draw a sphere? It's a typical first assignment in a drawing class. You start by just looking at it, <clears throat> look at the, where the highlight and the shadow is, the lightest and the darkest areas, and then you, you get a piece of paper and a piece of charcoal and you draw a circle. And then you darken it from the darkest part to the lightest point of the sphere. And then you look for the shadow shape and, and draw in the shadow shape and kind of fill that in. And then you kind of you know, continue observing it the entire time and look at any fine details you notice. Like if I look very closely here, the light, the bright lights here bounce back up off the bottom of the sphere and kind of put a lighter spot at the bottom of the sphere. So we'll just kind of lighten that in on the bottom a little bit. Now, on a computer application, like a, a 3D application like Maya, you can just click the sphere button, you get a perfectly shaded sphere. Click the light button, point it at the sphere, you'll get your light and shadow. Click the render button, you'll get a photorealistic sphere with reflections and bounce light. Now, with artificial intelligence, or more specifically, machine learning, you can just type, draw me a sphere, and describe it, and it will draw you exactly what you've described. So how do you prepare for a world that's changing so quickly because of machine learning? I'll be telling this from my point of view, which is from my field, which is in computer art, specifically in animation and visual effects. But I'm hoping it'll apply to your field as well. <clears throat> and I've spent my whole career, I had uh, humble beginnings. Um, you know, at home growing up, there was always paper and pencils on the kitchen table, and I really liked to draw. And then on my brother's 13th birthday, my parents came home with a gift for him that changed my life. It was a computer. Uh, this is back in the 1980s. It was an Apple IIe computer, which is much less powerful than what you're used to today, but it still was able to do some computer graphics. I remember early on uh, writing some code in a programming language called BASIC, where I put in the, the coordinates of the start of a line, 0 comma 0, and put in the coordinates of the end of the line, 20 comma 20, and it drew a diagonal line for me, amazing. And this launched my fascination and ultimately my career. I've worked at a whole series of major animation and visual effects companies, including Pixar, DreamWorks Animation, MPC, Framestore, Netflix Animation, and now DNEG Animation. And my job in all of these had to do with training and development. So the kinds of things they ask you to do in training and development at a big company like this is to help with the next big thing, right? When a new technology is coming in or a new technique, uh, they need you to either figure it out and teach it yourself or find someone who can do it and organize the training. And so I always had a front row seat to all the changes that have been happening. And it's been an extraordinary ride these past 25 years. The changes have come so fast and so extraordinary. I go, I go to computer graphics conferences and Every year, they cleared a new hurdle. So one year, it would be water. They could make photorealistic water. The next year, it would be fur. The year after that, it would be wet fur. And so finally, they made it so they could create a photorealistic version of anything you could imagine. And that's what we see in today's films. But this new change with machine learning feels different. It feels more pivotal than any of those changes we saw over the last couple decades. And it's not just me saying this, it's my colleagues as well. Um, many of you have probably already played with this a little bit. There are some popular things out there like uh, Dolly or Mid Journey. I'll show you some of what I did. When I got my hands on these, I was so excited. I was showing it to everybody. I, I would stop people in the pub and, and, and give them my prompt, which I'd ask for an animal doing something a human does in, a, in an interesting place, in an art style. And, uh, I'll give you a couple examples. This was a cat knitting in Hawaii. And, um, and I've got a few more. And you know, each time, I was just astounded. This is a, a, another cat one on the International Space Station slicing a pineapple. And, uh, and here, this one I thought was really interesting because I asked it to do an octopus 
doing yoga. And I just thought, that really does, like, how did it think to put the, an octopus in that pose? Just, I'm constantly astounded by this. And also terrified, right? This is amazing, but also terrifying. It's, it's an extraordinary gift we've been given. It's an incredible power. And it reminds me of the myth of Prometheus. Prometheus was this god that gave humans uh, the gift of fire. And so prior to Prometheus, prior to our control of fire, you'd have people shivering in a village, but then suddenly we have fire, and one person's cooking food to make it more nutritious, someone else is lighting the way with a torch, someone else is heating their home with it, but not everybody uses fire for good things. It has a, it's a double-edged sword, right? Maybe there's one person in the, the village, um, let's call him a saint, for example, and um, let's say uh, that he didn't like everybody else in the village and never got along with them, and suddenly he's, he wants to use fire for evil, and so he waits till they're all in the communal cabin, and he locks it, and he sets it ablaze, right? So this feels like that level of power, like, like a big a turn as humans getting fire to me. But one of people's biggest fears is their jobs, right? People have already lost work, right? Because when you look at those images, how would they have done those in the past? Someone would have come up with an idea, you'd have given the brief to an artist, they'd do some thumbnail sketches, come back to the client, uh, do a few rounds of that, iterate on the idea. It could take days or weeks to come up with an images. Those images were created, that we just saw were created in 30 seconds. So what happens to that person, right, who used to do concept art? Will they still have work? People are scared for their jobs. But I have a reason why I think that the net sum of jobs is not going to decrease. And that goes back to this whole history. If, have any of you ever watched the credits on an animated feature film or a visual effects film? They're really long. <laughs> There's a lot of names that go by on the screen. But what's interesting is that a film of today has a much longer credit roll than a film of, say, 20 or 25 years ago. And yet, in the interim, We've gotten way more powerful computers, better software, we've solved problems, we've come up with new techniques and efficiencies, and yet it takes way more people to make a film. So as the tools have become stronger and more accessible, the demand has only increased. And by the way, there's way more films being made now too. When I was a kid, you were lucky if you got one animated film a year. Now there's at least a dozen, and almost every film has some kind of visual effects in it. And then think of other fields like video games or the metaverse. There's an unending demand for creative content. But what's lost in the process if you're having the computer kind of come up with some of the creative ideas? Let me give you an example from my life. So uh, we lived in a flat before that didn't have a dishwasher. And uh, I used to wash a lot of dishes, and I actually really enjoyed it. Like, I'd, I'd turn on the hot water, steam would be coming up, my hands would get warm, I'd lather up the soap, the grease would come off the dish, um, grabbing a dish towel, polishing it to a shine, putting away while it was still warm. It felt like this elemental connection to something real in a life where everything seems so artificial, where I spend my whole day on a computer screen, on Zoom calls, and thinking about abstract ideas. Then we moved into a place that has a dishwasher. And now, do I still wash the dishes? No, everything goes into the dishwasher, everything I could possibly get in there. Oh, geez, is this one uh, dishwasher safe? We'll find out about that. They all go in there. And do I miss it? Do I miss some spiritual connection to the dishes? Well, maybe, but I think that the loss, when you're talking about the creation of ideas, is different from a machine that washes your dishes. And where do ideas even come from? Do they come from the muses? Do they come from the gray matter in our side or head or some kind of just a collection of our experiences? I'm not gonna try to answer that question. But what I can say from experience is that ideas seem to come from doing things, right? You, you draw that sphere, the first mark leads to the next mark, which leads to the next and ideas start flowing, or you start typing something, and your ideas start coming out. So they seem to come by doing. And will, will a young person want to learn to draw if a computer can draw better for them? Will they want to learn to write if a computer can write better for them? 
So how do we prepare for this world where machine learning is changing things so quickly? Well, my first advice is to embrace the change. It's not going away. You can't fight it. The genie is already out of the bottle. People have access to this all over the world. And, it's, and the rate of innovation is astounding. Every week a new paper comes out leaping forward. So embrace it. But then I say focus on the fundamentals. What do I mean by fundamentals? I mean things that were just as true 100 years ago as they are today. So take that sphere we were drawing, right? Understanding light and shadow. Understanding color and tone. Understanding shapes. Shapes can be used for touching the emotion of people in visual images, right? So take a circle, for example. A circle is a really friendly shape. It's like the, the shape of a, a baby's chubby cheeks or a cute cartoon character, like wide open eyes. It doesn't have any sharp corners. It's not going to hurt you. It's a bouncing ball, right? A square, well, that's a little bit more formidable, right? It might, it's kind of standing up there. It's not so easy to move, right? It does have a couple sharp corners. Triangle, that's just dangerous, right? That's like the tip of a spear. It's a dagger. It's out to hurt you, okay? And so everything in a visual image can be broken down into squares, circles, and triangles. And you can use fundamentals to create those shapes. You can use shapes of shadow, shapes of characters, shapes of architecture, and you can emotionally affect the viewer by using these fundamental shapes. So that's just one example, right? And it matters, the emotion you put into images, because that's what, what makes us unique. It's a dangerous thing to say <laughs> when things are changing so quickly, but computers can't feel. Feelings have a physical part to them, right? Like if, if, if you're embarrassed, your, your face turns warm and, and hot, kind of red. Or if you're nervous, you might get butterflies in your stomach, or your knees might shake, right? There's a physical connection to emotions that a computer can't have. Right? And we want to make people feel something from the images we create. And we also want to put our own emotions into the images that we're offering. That the images should tell a story. They should have some meaning behind them. Other examples of fundamentals are understanding composition, perspective, rhythm, movement, tone, color. If you can understand these things and manipulate them when you create visual images, you will be prepared to create those images no matter what the tools are. So why do these fundamentals matter? Well, as the tools become more accessible to everyone to create images, then the ideas behind them become yet even more important. It's not enough just to have a role in executing the final image. You have to have the ideas behind it. And there's more fundamental fundamentals than things like shape and color. There's what do you have to say in the first place? We have this brief moment on this planet where we can say something and leave something behind. What's meaningful to you that you want to express with these images? Because now you have the tools to do it yourself. So we're embracing the, the new technology. We're returning the fundamentals. But I'm not suggesting that you move away from new technology by embracing fundamentals. What I'm saying, in fact, quite the opposite, right? You need to master something, right? Use the tools of today to master a specific craft. You know, there's a number of animation students here today. Maybe it's, you want to be a character animator. Maybe you want to do lighting and rendering. You need to focus on one thing and master that one thing. Because mastery itself is a skill that's going to pay off in a world where things are changing really quickly because you're going to need to master new techniques and new tools. And if you've mastered one, then you'll be able to master another one. So how do you prepare for a world that's changing so quickly because of machine learning? You embrace the technology, go along for the ride, you focus on the fundamentals, and you master something.
Thank you.